Michael Hawk, and I endorse this Ishi Survival in Medicine documentary and recommend it to the general survival arena. I'm Michael Hawk, former Green Beret, combat commander, and government contractor. I've served in Afghanistan, worked in Iraq, fought in Sierra Leone, Colombia, Azerbaijan, and more. This, this type of thing, about 25 years ago, I'm a former Green Beret medic, I'm a former Special Forces medic, 18 Delta, and I was teaching survival both in the military and in the civilian world back then. All right, we're ready to take off into this she wilderness, got the pack on. Got our rope, everything's secure, and off we go. Okay, so Ishi made this rack here. He put a couple timbers up this way, this one went up, and this was cross beam that went up high. We got the soap plant here. Yeah. If you peel it back, just like a banana, off the stem, but this is all very edible. It's a great rhizome as a root. Right. And it's part of the volcanic mud flow and it's embedded in there like cement. And it looks like somebody came along with a hammer stone. It's an exact yeah. pattern where they knocked flakes off the bottom and off the top to get this good material. It's called a bedrock milling surface. It hasn't had a lot of use, but it does some shine. A little bit of polish right here. Ishii has made arrows in groups of five. Thus, you would select the best of these sticks and collect them in groups and bind them together securely. The wood was warm, it gave very readily to pressure. In less than a minute, any curve or crook could be straightened out. After the glue was applied, the point was further secured by binding it with chewed sinew, back and forth around the tanks and around the shaft. Ishii's quiver was made from the skin of a river otter. For most of his life, Ishii depended on his archery skills for his very survival. This rock is interesting. So this is Ghost Rock. Ooh. Is she supposedly grew up over there at Iron Mountain? Jerry Creek comes right between Ghost Rock there and the Bluff. Okay. We're on the other side. Just pulled everything out. Here's the water bag, camera, appears dry. Ah, oh, man, I'll tell you, it is freezing cold. But you can see how red I am. Still. Toes are completely numb. It's cold. So now what I've done here is I've taken several things. I've taken some of my buckeye. Then I broke open some acorns and I put acorn in. A little toy and berry, grapes. Then I'm putting the cap back on like this here.
The Ishii saga remains complex and highly debatable. However, this documentary shows that Ishii and his sister could have survived in the Deer Creek watershed. You can see shells coming off very nicely. So the main things that the Yahi had then were acorn like this and buckeye, both with tannins. And so they've got to be leached out. Okay, next, I'm going to smash up my buckeye. Got a rock right here. Let's do it. Do it. There is our corral where we're leaching buckeye and acorn. We can see the rocks on top of them, holding them down underneath the water. I'm gonna get a couple acorn. They're a lot better than yesterday when I was more poisonous. So what we have here is buckeye. Buckeye is wonderful because it puts out such a nice fruit. Almost looks like a pear hanging there. And what's wonderful about this is the buckeye has a very edible nut in it, right there. And then you can use the shell as a little container to hold your berries or your seeds. This can be roasted, it can be boiled. I like to roast it right next to the fire, and then it becomes like a potato, and then you can chop it up and you throw it in a stew or something of that nature, or boil it again and eat it more raw. Well, is one of the woods that Ishi would use for his hearth and his uh, fire rod. Just take that apart. There we are, what I always eat. Right there. It's my favorite when it's roasted. Got my grill. So I can just keep going like this here. So we're going to want to cut it off. Right there. What I've done here is I've got my rods and then my hearth. Which is right here. I'm after that to be used in my hearth so my stick can go in there. Little drill holes will be wonderful. Put my foot down. Yeah. Just like that, like a monkey. Just raking it. We have a nice little bundle here. Just a nest that's going to hold our hot coal. This is the one on more of the dry wood. Okay, keep it on there. Keep it on the, the ember. Pick the ember up. It is a false belief to conclude that the resources dwindled so much that Ishii could not survive, or that Ishii's sister could not have lived on after fleeing from Grizzly Bear's hiding place. Women are every bit as capable of surviving in the wilderness as men. Ishii's sister fled with an old Yahi man, which increased both of their chances of survival. Although settlers were in competition for large game, the area's flora and fauna could have still sustained Yahi life. Cattle could not eat all of the plants because cattle could not rock climb, and the rodents or squirrels and rabbits were not all taken. Now what I'm doing here is eating a little bit of gum plant along with a toy and berry. So what we have here is gum plant. And it's quite tasty. It smells nice. The bed cameras can't smell. Over here, more acorns that aren't long versus the long ones. So you can really see the yellow acorns now. These aren't near as bitter. We're using the husk or the shell of the buckeye as a container. We're also using it to steam. And we can dump water on that to keep it more moist. Buckeye, shell, 
skin, then it's raw in there. I've already picked it open like potato. Then we have over here grape. Nice thing about a warm grape is that the um, seeds come out super well. And manzanita right there also got seeds. And what we've done is we've put both of those over here. There are the manzanita seeds and in that one over there I've got the grape seeds. Just to indicate or to show that you wouldn't spit out all these seeds if you could help it it's because you can use all that to mill down and make flour. Then our toyin berry it's like a little apple. Very good eating. Bay. This is the bay buds. What's nice about bay buds they're like the young bay leaves. They're not overwhelmingly aromatic or anything. Then we've got the juniper. Good Christmas scent. You can take a little bit of mint and juniper and bite them together and they're really good. Mint's wild out here too. Now, got more grape. And the grape leaves can be used to put uh, paste in. If I were to grind up this stuff that was already leached for 12 hours, smash it up like flour I could squeeze it and then wrap it into a uh, leaf and then put it by the fire to cook it. Only a few days out we've already got some rods, a couple hearths, 12 assorted foods, little tindal bundle, everything from raw to cook Toyin. Manzanita. We've got some big seeds. This was a area I found several times hiking through. Now Mike's taking a look at it. I always just thought it would be a great survival cave because you could get way deep back there and reserve your body heat. And Mike's got a stone here, milling well, this slab. This is a, a milling slab that was just getting started. And what they did is they found a cobble down on the creek. And it looks like they used another stone to peck it and to start this concave recess, slightly recessed area. You still see a lot of the peck marks. It hasn't been finished. It hasn't been smoothed out yet. So for whatever reason, they stopped and they left it alone where it is. Now if this had been in use, this concave spot would be bigger and slightly deeper and be very, very smooth. An example of that is this one which is a well-worn milling slab that has been broken. Oh. Um, probably through fire, fractured. But imagine it coming down in a bowl where it's smooth and really worn yes. from a lot of years of uh, grinding seeds. Right on. Or plant material. So I came along here and I saw this other stone I showed Mike, and it appears to be another milling stone. So we'll let Mike talk about that. If we have two more, two more good milling stones. This one's been broken, but you can see when the sun's on it just right, you can see that nice sheen right there. It almost it. looks like little pieces of pyrite, huh? Yep. Just a little bit of flake. Just a little bit of shine. Yeah. It's in the areas where it's been used the most. And it would have come out further. It's been broken for whatever reason. And this one <clears> has a lot of use. You can see where it's worn down. Yes. At least an inch. So this was uh, obviously a place for, for working with uh, plant material. Right on. This is a, a bedrock mortar. Bedrock mortars, okay. And oh yeah, you can kind of see they might started have, working a little there maybe. Might have, might have had a little use there. But this one's impressive. Just for the width. Poison oak. 
Yeah, this is one of the larger ones I've seen for out here. Yeah, usually we don't see them that wide. That's 20 centimeters, closer to 18. On depth. And you're measuring to right here or yes. to that line? To, to about where you see the general wear. Oh, okay. Which is about like that. Uh-huh. And then for width, we have about 37 centimeters. It's, usually you don't find them bowl shaped like that. Usually they're, they're only about this big around. And they can be up to a cubit deep, which uh -huh. is fingers to elbow. So basically we can assume that this camp was a long-term camp to grind it down that long? Could have been seasonal. Just, but you know, How many generations to grind a rock down there? Is it 10 generations, 2 generations, 60 this is, years? This is hard basalt rock. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Yeah. At least to get down. So, Mike's found a tobacco can here. And tell us the story on this. Well, this is a, a Prince Albert tobacco can. And it's got a little hinge oh, top. Wow. Still in good condition. There's nothing inside it. But these are pretty common to find in, you know, camp areas, homestead areas uh -huh. from around 1900 or so. And um, it's a Prince Albert. And this one's in really good shape. You can almost see a little bit of the paint label still on it. Now, is this something a collector could just pick up and throw in his backpack? No, if you find something like this, it's obviously older than 45 to 50 years old. It's, uh, it's, it's protected under an Antiquities Act. Okay. And so you got to leave it alone. You're not even really supposed to disturb it. I see. Um, of course, if it's on government property. If it's on your property, it's yours. Oh, okay. But government property, if you find it, you're supposed to just kind of leave it alone. You know, somebody else can come and look at it, take pictures of it, whatever. So. Passable, if not, I think this other way may be. Yeah. Up got a lot of lithic debitage here. The debitage is, is broken stone. Quite a fire pit. This is called a bifus. And it's because both faces have been worked. See Wait, that? That's been worked. Flip it over, it's been worked. All right. And they were using it as a core. Here's a nice obsidian flake. All right. But see how dark that is? Yeah. That's from a different source than the Canoctis. This is different. Mike's trying to match the picture here of Vichyana Storage Cave. And we're looking at the rock now. We're thinking this is not the same cave. This is a whole different one. Here is digging up some soap plant. Right now it's uh, December, so the ground's pretty saturated with moisture. So I can just take my hands and pull out these rocks and start digging. Of course, you can get a digging stick or whatever you want. They're about eight inches down. They can go as deep as um, 12 inches. And sometimes, unfortunately, they get go under a rock and then you can't get to them. And again, that's what they look like right there. And now what I can do in the springtime is as these wavy soap plant leaves come off, I just eat the tops of them, like that. Or I pull them and I pull the heart of the bulb out and you get a real nice inner core of it. Um, and then eventually you roast them. And when you roast them, you leave the skin on or all these things, but down in here, it's beautiful, it's white. And we can eat this raw as well. If we open this up, get to the very heart of it, there, now you can see. So we got layers, kind of like an artichoke, but down here in the very bottom we have the heart. And that tastes a little soapy, but here you can see how perfect that heart is. While here, these parts you eat like an artichoke. You take it and go like that and get it off the sides of the leaves. But the heart's still wonderful. And when you cook it, you don't get that lather. Right now, my mouth is lathery a little bit because the sap pulled in. It stuns the fish. So we grind up all this, mess it up, and we start making a lather, put some water in. We take it all, we throw that into the creek, and suddenly as the fish are swimming around, their gills can't 
get the oxygen because the soap's in the way. So they get stunned and they fall to the wayside and then you can pick up your fish while the creek washes away and diffuses out the saponins. Then they wake up. So we're not hurting the fish, but we gotta pick them up before they wake up. So we'll get a few of these and roast them. Ishii's family was in hiding for either real or perceived fear. Historically, the Yahi were in hiding for a valid reason, as Indian bounty hunters, backed by the United States government, murdered them. There was risk of being discovered when traveling to hunt, fish, or harvest wild edible and medicinal plants or seasonal fruits and seeds, which was much more of a problem than the lack of food. It's more likely that Ishii left the area because of loneliness or his being tired about being boxed in with the added burden to clandestinely harvest things beyond the Bears Terrace area. People loved and still loved the idea about a small band of wild people resisting the ugliness of modern industrialism, hiding in a cozy family unit near clean water, with clean air, no noisy cities, and no crowds. However, living wild and surviving off the land is seldom romantic or preferred. It can be dangerous and a very hard life. Ishii himself did not choose to return to his homelands permanently, even after being offered later. Based on this documentary area study, one must consider that books and movies have incorrectly sensationalized Ishii as being the last Yahi Stone Age survivor in America. It's a charming illusion of romance and adventure of the wild California frontier, especially as the Ishii wilderness looks barren and uninhabitable. But it's not so to the trained survivalist who knows wild edible and medicinal plants. Whether anthropology professor Alfred Krober, who took Ishii in under his wing, wittingly or unwittingly allowed such illusion about the Ishii saga to unfold is not known. However, there is no doubt that his portrayal of Ishii enlightened folks to be more sensitive about how poorly early America treated Native Americans. December 20th and you're eating grapes. So again, this is a very diverse zone down here next to Bear Creek, perfect to survive. A lot of diversity. There we are. This is a beautiful, nice deep pool that she enjoyed that for fishing.
uh, for this type of survival bow is you need to uh, taper the ends and give it what's called a rat tail on either end. So in other words, you need to make it so it tillers or that it has a, an even bend from the center all the way through the end. Now here you see I'm just basically kind of tillering portions of it right there on that bench and getting an idea as to how those portions are. And what, I, what I'm looking for is just a nice smooth even bend from the center all the way to the tip. And then I tiller the whole bow together and I get an even bend all the way from the center through both tips. And so what you end up with then is a bow that isn't gonna, it's gonna have a less uh, possibility of, of breaking, of course, and it's gonna have a nice even pull, it's not gonna stack. To me, a survival bow is something you can cut down in about 30 minutes. And I stand by that. I think that if you can make a survival bow in about 30 minutes to maybe an hour, and then take about the same amount of time for a couple of arrows, you're doing pretty good. And that's what I define as a survival bow. And there's a lot of different types of survival bows, but the time involved and in the, in the labor involved, again, ration sweat, not water, as the saying goes, that's what we're after. So on to Ash Juniper. It's just a great, great wood, and it's just a great tree. What, what I'm talking about here is a green survival bow. We're making it with green wood. I don't expect it to last more than a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. Um, I'm getting about a 40 to a 50 pound pull off of this, and it's a great bow. I'm shooting at 30 feet, and after about uh, 10 shots or so, I was definitely able to get a pretty good, a pretty tight group on these. Wow, Juniper, look at the size of this. Beautiful. I mean, these can get like 35 feet, and, and, and they're thought after because this is what you want to use to make a bow, like in a bow and arrow. And there, we're cutting it off here at the base. And then this juniper is just wonderful. Or juniper berries. Again, he's boiled up. And the little cones here, these can be squashed up if you want, but basically, you wait till the berry comes, you know, and from the a berry, they make gin and stuff like that. It's great antiseptic and other medicinal uses. It's quite diverse. Throughout history, wood from the yew tree has been a preferred material for making bows. Details on how Ishii made his arrows are recorded in several references, including Yanni Archery, written by Saxon Pope in 1918, Hunting with the Bow and Arrow, written by Saxon Pope in 1923, and Ishii in Two Worlds, written by Theodora Kober in 1961. This smooth layer under the bark will become the back of our bow. I began by splitting the log along its natural grain using wooden wedges. Once the log was split, I began shaping a bow stave the basic design of the longbow I will be making will be thicker in the handle and gradually taper to a thinner diameter near the nox. As you form your bow stave, you begin to see the unique characteristics of yew wood that makes it ideal for making a bow. The darker heartwood is able to withstand the compression forces and the lighter sapwood is able to withstand the tension forces that are put on it as an arrow is drawn. When shaping the bow stave, I begin by marking the center of the bow and the area where the handle will be. I then begin to shape the bow using stone tools. For this bow, I will be using flakes of obsidian, which are incredibly sharp, but become dull very quickly. These obsidian flakes can be used as a draw knife to shave down the wood. I usually get about five minutes of use out of each flake before it becomes too dull and needs to be replaced. As you remove excess wood, the basic form of the bow begins to take shape. It is at this point that you want to see how the limbs are bending. This process is called floor tailoring, and it lets you see which areas of the limbs are still too thick and need to have wood removed, and it lets you see how each limb is bending in proportion to each other. Once the limbs of the bow are bending evenly, it's time to form the knocks to fit the bowstring. The most simple way to do this is to cut two grooves into the wood at the end of the bow. Now that the knocks are complete, we are ready to string the bow and start the final tillering process. The most important part of this step is to make sure that each limb of the bow is bending evenly. 
you can see here that the lower limb is bending more than the upper limb and that the tips of the bow are still very stiff. To correct this problem, I shaved down the thicker areas on the upper limb and lightly shaved down the tips of the bow. While it's still not perfect yet, you can see that the upper and lower limb are bending much more evenly with each other. After some final fine tuning adjustments, we are ready to put the finish on the bow. I do this by using a plant called a scour rush, which is in the horsetail family. This primitive plant contains silica in its cell walls, which allows it to be used as a fine grit sandpaper to put a smooth finish on our bow. We have here is joint grass. This is very common in the western days. People used it to scrub pots and pans. Many campers do today because the outer portion has silicon, so it's tough and fibrous. But the inner pulp is quite edible. As we peel it apart and open this up, we're going to find a thin layer of pulp, which is edible. It's not a lot. As you go down on the nodes, you're going to find a little bit more. Let's take a look. Let me get a specimen here. And as you see, it grows in the wet areas. Now we can see that pulp right in there. That pulp's right at the node. And pulled apart, now you can see a little bit more of the pulp. This pulp is edible. And a little bit more here. Like most plants, some are going to vary in taste, depending on exactly where they're growing. The final step is to waterproof the wood using natural oils. I like to do this by rubbing the entire bow with chunks of deer fat. Now our bow is ready to shoot in all kinds of weather. This finished bow shoots incredibly well and pulls about 75 pounds in draw weight. I've got a floor, floor plan view sketch that shows where they all are. And I've oh, got yeah. notes for which ones are saw cut. Which ones aren't. Oh, cool. You're really taking details. Yeah, I got the floor, you know, the slope of it. Oh, wow. Neat. I just can't do it. Just can't match it. Can't match it, no. From this spot. This has got to be something of significance. You know, if this was anything of significance, I could see why if she wouldn't show Krober it. Because this might be a very sacred site. When making arrows, the first thing is to get the shaft. Ishii used many types of wood, but he preferred hazel. The native bamboo-like reed was also a great favorite. When gathering wood for the arrow, he generally selected the tall, straight shoots of hazel where it grew in competition with other shrubs or trees, cutting them to about a yard in length, their greatest diameter being a little more than three-eighths of an inch. These he stripped off the bark with his thumbnail. After any period from a week to a year, these sticks might be used. In general, Ishii made a compound arrow consisting of a main shaft and a removable foreshaft. This allowed him to quickly change from a wooden point used for hunting small games and birds to an obsidian point for hunting deer and bear. The foreshaft was made of heavier wood, frequently dogwood.
I was able to find some mountain mahogany in a landscape that is typically dominated by juniper and sagebrush, making this ideal material for floor shafts. The tight growth rings in this tree indicate that it takes several decades to grow a few inches. The foreshaft was the same diameter as the arrow, only tapering a trifle towards the front end, and usually was about 6 inches long. It was carefully shaped into a spindle at the larger end and set into the recently drilled hole of the shaft using glue or resin. Ishii's hunting shafts were of two kinds, obsidian pointed and blunts. For shooting small games such as birds and rabbits, the latter was used. For killing deer, bear, and predatory animals, sharp arrows were used. On arrows with sharp points, a groove had to be cut into the foreshaft to fit the obsidian point. When fletching arrows, Ishii used eagle, buzzard, hawk, or flicker feathers. By preference, he took them from the wings but he did not hesitate to use tail feathers if he was reduced to it. These bird species are all protected and it is not legal to use their feathers for arrows. Suitable substitutes are turkey feathers, which Ishii preferred while with Saxon Pope, or goose feathers, which are very similar to buzzard feathers. The feathers were attached to the arrow with long strands of sinew from the back or leg of a deer. These tendons can be pulled away into fine strips and chewed until soft and used to wrap the feathers, the foreshaft, and the point onto the arrow. Before attaching the feathers, Ishii painted his arrow shafts. His typical design was a series of red and green alternating rings or a series of red and blue alternating rings with wavy lines. The pigments Ishii used in the wild were red cinnabar, black pigment from the eye of a trout, a green vegetable dye from wild onion, and a blue obtained from what he said was the root of a plant.
the smaller end of the shaft he cut the notch for the bowstring with a bit of obsidian making this knock up to a half an inch deep next the larger end of the shaft was drilled out to accommodate the foreshaft during this drilling process the lower end of the shaft was tightly bound with sinew or cedar cord to keep it from splitting his method of drilling was as follows placing a sharp piece of bone point up in the ground and steadying it with his toes he rotated the shaft upon this point the motion was identical to that employed in making fire by means of drill the stick being rolled between the palms with a downward pressure the excavation averaged an inch deep and a quarter of an inch in diameter when a group of five arrows had been brought to this stage of completion ishi painted them his favorite colors were green and red at first he insisted these were the only colors to use since they had the effect of making an arrow fly straight but after saxon pope began to beat him in marksmanship he scraped off all the paint and replaced it with a red and blue design the colors were applied with a little stick or hairs from a fox's tail that were drawn through a quill when a number of shafts had been painted ishi was ready to feather them he did this by carefully separating the bristles at the tip of the feathers with his fingers and pulling them apart splitting the quilt its entire length once the feathers were split ishi would take a piece of obsidian and scrape away the pith until the rib was thin and flat he would then drop the feathers in a vessel of water when thoroughly wet and limp they were ready to use one by one he laid the feathers in position binding them down with the sinew. The back ends of the feathers were now secure and they were set aside to dry. Once dry, he was ready to secure the binding on the front part of the fletchings. He did this by wrapping several layers of wet sinew around the tips of each quill and then pulled the feathers down till they were straight and taut. After drying, the feathers were cut with a sharp piece of obsidian using a straight stick as a guide and laying the arrow on a flat piece of wood. During this process, Ishii would leave the natural curve of the feather so that it drooped over the end of the knock. He felt this gave an attractive quality to his arrows and aided in the steering qualities as it flew through the air. With the main shaft now complete, the arrow is ready for either a wooden blunt foreshaft used for target practice or hunting small game, or a foreshaft with an obsidian point used for hunting large game. In this type of point, a groove must be cut into the end of the foreshaft to accommodate the stone point. Ishii glued his points to the foreshaft with pine resin and finished securing them with wrap sinew. Over time, pure pine resin becomes hard and brittle, and I prefer instead to use a natural glue made of pine pitch, charcoal, and fine vegetated material. To make this natural glue, begin by melting some pine pitch, then slowly add the other ingredients. When cool, these heads frequently were kept in a little bag of skin and not attached to the arrow till a few hours before the expected hunt. We'll want to get all this trace meat off. That's no good. And that's great. Now we've got a little hide. Hide here. Everything came out good. Legs, head. We're and here I've just washed off the skin a little bit. What I've done here is just gone ahead and hung that squirrel skin. Washed it off. And there's a bunch of bees on there. It's exactly what I want. I want the insect. The hide. And I've let it become like rawhide. Now what I'll do is scrape some of this collagen off <clears throat> of the rawhide and then use it for glue. Mix it up. Um, and then here, I can easily sew this into a pouch or anything I want. Add to our spice flavor. Put that flap down. Same thing all over. Now, this is the wild ginger, so I want that up in the abdomen. Ginger leaf. Uh, let's see, I think I'll wrap him under the armpit. If I take it and I cut a little bit of the muscle open right here, now I've got a little area where I can put my spice. And I can take a little wormwood, stick it down in that thigh like that. Uh, let's go with a little sage on that one. I think we'll get one more. This 
evergreen. A little easier to work with. End product. Nothing fancy. Flavor and juices in there. He threw his anus and out his mouth so he's not going to fall off. So it's just a matter of rotating that stick every now and then. And we've burned down, but it's the green vine. It still is green. So it's still holding it all together. Get the meat real quick. Oh yeah, let's take it see how it is. Mmm. Spice plant, sage, tastes it all. And if you take that piece of meat and a little bit of the spices in there, as Andy Griffith would say, mmm, mmm, good. Stories like the Trail of Tears seem unimaginable today. The Kingsley Cave Massacre on Mill Creek was horrifying as white people shot Yahi men, women, and babies to death. It is not known why Ishii's sister did not rally up or link up with Ishii after his Yahi family was discovered. Maybe she had enough of hiding and decided to try and link with some other local natives instead. Is she saying that his sister likely drowned in Deer Creek, or fell off of a cliff bluff, or was eaten by a cougar, may have been a cover story hoping she escaped to safety. Possibly, Ishii himself was in denial about her ability to survive, or he had false beliefs that she could not join some other local tribe. Don's informant, Mountain Maidu Elder, Lily Baker, who was a basket weaver and the last of her shaman family, plus shaman Brian Beavers of the Konkau Maidu, both say that Ishi's mother was Maidu. Mr. Beavers retelling his tribal story about Murder Rock, where Ishi's father was supposedly murdered in retaliation for his earlier kidnapping of Ishi's mother from her Maidu tribe, supports the possibility that Ishi might have thought that he was unwelcome in other lands. Perhaps his sister thought differently and that retaliation was solely aimed at their father and not Ishi or his sister, as the Maidu were historically a peaceful people. Just like people have false beliefs about the Ishi saga today, so too Ishi may have had false beliefs and remained in hiding unnecessarily. Certainly when he came out of hiding in 1911, he was not harmed, but rather given a unique way to university professors to document his tribe. Now we can see it better. Basically between that pole there and this here, there's an area there that's uh, more of a flat terrace. Not real flat, but flat enough that you could find places to camp. Cave. Waters Cave is where Ishii took his mother after Bear's hiding place was compromised. Supposedly she died six months later in Waters Cave. And then Ishii went across the creek here and built a shack someplace. So as we go into the Waters Cave, tons of rose hips. So is she still could harvest stuff here? There's Mike standing outside of it. So one skin at the water cave, which is in behind all that density for resources. We have toyenberry, blackberry, grape. Let's call that our fruit family, three items. Then we've got <clears throat> joint grass, right here. Bay tree. Also as a resource of just the grass to make in baskets and stuff.
wood firm. Ah, there we go. I see some spice plant. Okay. And then, of course, acorns. And we'll probably end up with some wormwood in through here if we start looking on a trail. No. I know. Okay, Mike is going in. This is like the 100 foot ledge. Alright, let's go in. And it's uh, quite something. Walking along the base of the cliff underneath all this. Well, this is a hard drip line to survey anyways because it's so muddy and you know the it's river gorgeous. comes down. The drip line and we were just standing in it, just coming down. You got water right there. All the trash is just destroyed Waters Cave. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's all survivable crap you'd be happy to have if you were really out here surviving. It'd be a gold mine, but, you know, a jacket and stuff. You know, it could be also that when they came down here and raided, raided it, they had just thrown everything all around. Yeah. He might have had it nice and tight. He might, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. So you're looking for anything for grinding? Yeah, I see a little bit of polish on that. I think so, huh? I mean, that could just be from this guy using this. Uh-huh. If you feel that. See this right here? Yeah. This dark spot? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely where the question is, was it from this year or is it from this guy that lived here? Yeah. Oh, a little bit of indentation there, yeah. That could be. Yeah. That is. That's a that's the grinding surface, so so is she or somebody used this right here. Yeah. See and this is the same thing when people come in campers and they grab the wrong rock and we lose data. Right there. Yeah. Almost like some peck marks, but that could have been him for sure. Because yeah. those look more new. Mm -hmm. My goodness. What a shame. Perfect example of a camper using a stone that's actually a grinding stone. As people watch my videos on how to make primitive bows and arrows, a very common question I get is how do you make a primitive bowstring? And I guess that depends on what your definition of primitive archery is. I tend to define it as making your bows and arrows out of all natural materials, uh, usually that you collect out of the wild or grow in your garden and then process into the final product. And with that definition in mind, I use several natural materials for a primitive bowstring. My favorite is the back sinew, the tendons of a deer or elk. They can be twisted into a very strong bowstring and they work great and have been used for thousands of years. I have had problems with them failing though in late archery season in the wet weather when they get wet. So I like to have a backup made out of a plant-based primitive bowstring. And so for that, I grew this plant in the garden this year. This is the flax plant. This particular variety is called Marilyn. And it's called Marilyn because this variety grows long, strong linen fibers uh, that remind them of Marilyn Monroe's hair. And it's very easy with very little effort and small space. You can grow this plant and enough to make many, many bowstrings. And there's a lot of tutorials on how to process uh, the linen fibers from the flax plant. But since this is for a primitive bowstring, the only tools I'm going to use are this elk antler. Uh, it's very simple to uh, get these fibers out and twist it into a bowstring. And to help hold these fibers together, I'm going to use this. This is a ball of beeswax. I collected this from a wild honeybee hive in a tree that blew over. And that's all you need uh, is a little beeswax, some linen fiber, and an elk antler. And we'll twist our primitive archery bowstring that's strong enough to hold a 70-pound uh, U longbow. Now this here is milkweed. It's quite edible, and inside the leaf is a whitish substance, as you can see. And the stem's got more. There it is, dripping out of the stem right now. Let's see. Like that. All 
Right there it is. And it's quite edible. Pods, everything. So, I've been eating it a few times on the way up here. I started by planting my flax seeds in the spring. I got a lot of fiber out of this tiny little patch. So if you even have a little bit of land, you can grow your own bowstring. I wanted to harvest them before they fully went to seed. About 100 days after planting them, they looked perfect. The stalks started to turn yellow at the base and they, they started to slowly be dying back. I'm ready so. to start getting the fibers out of these flax plants after they've been dried to get the linen. And the first thing I do is I just run my fingers down and strip off all the little leaves and use my fingers to tear off the tops here. And the bottoms, the stem at the base is pretty stiff. So I just kind of work those off and those come right off too. You can start to see the flax fibers are teased out here. And those flax fibers run along the outside of this stalk and there's kind of a pithy, almost woody center. I just run it along this elk antler. I just sit there and uh, run it like this. And that, what that does is break up that stem and those uh, flax fibers bend around the antler, but the pithy stem does not, it kind of breaks up. So you're able to really quickly run out and you'll see those fibers start to uh, separate themselves. And then I just use my fingernail, run it over it, Pull that pith off on both sides here. And I got the, the flax fibers, that's all I need. This is incredibly strong. As soon as you give it one little twist and pull, I can't break it with my hands. I mean, this is strong plant fiber. I was just gonna show you real quick up close what I'm doing with these plant fibers. You don't have to use an antler. You can use a stick or anything firm, but all you have to do is bend that stalk of the flax right around something hard and uh, break up that pith. Now we have our linen fibers separated. We're ready to start twisting them into our bowstring. On their own, these linen fibers are only two to three feet in length, which is pretty long for plant fibers. But as we twist them together, we'll be able to make this bowstring whatever length we need for a longbow. Uh, the first step is to take small groups of these fibers and we're gonna be making some thread by running it over the uh, beeswax. And as the beeswax coats these fibers, they stick together and really turn into a nice uh, thin thread that doesn't fray. So I'll be making quite a few little clumps of this uh, waxed linen thread. What I'm gonna do is just lay out my different strands and I'm gonna stagger them uh, on both ends so that the ends of these uh, groups of fibers aren't all meeting at the same point. And that will provide strength in our total bow, uh, bow string. Now what I do is I take this clump of fibers together and I want to make sure this is about the diameter I want for my final bowstring, which it looks pretty good. And so what I'm going to do is take a group like this and I'm going to make my first loop. So this is what I'm looking for on my knock. This is the start of the bowstring and I want it to be, uh, just from trial and error of making quite a few of these, I want it to be about that big around. And uh, as I twist it together, I want to make sure it's twisted pretty tight. I'm going to cross it over on itself here. And I'm going to take one of these clumps of strings and just hold everything together by wrapping that joint right there. I usually give it two to three good wraps. And uh, I'll even go on the inside here. There's lots of different ways to make bowstrings. This is just the way I like to do it. And uh, like that and then come back around and that just really secures that loop and keeps it at the size you want. You could go back around the other way and that is perfect. So now that I have our loop started we're ready to start twisting these together and what I like to do is take fibers from this side and fibers from this side kind of tease them out and then uh, twist them on themselves and uh, that will give you a really uh, strong bond there that uh, won't come loose or lengthen your bowstring as it's under pressure and tension from the pulling back the bow. So you can just kind of work these out and twist those together and uh, do that several times with different groups. So one from this side, tease them out, pull it over, tease them out from here and twist those together and you're gonna have an incredibly strong bowstring here. This is a subject to go out and use an eye wash as you need. Um, but I, I think that 
it's just one of those things that, that, that a lot of people don't really either know about or just don't don't use and it's very effective to give an eye wash why would we give an herbal eye wash to somebody and there's a lot of different reasons you know either you could be you could be an injury you know a corneal abrasion or something where you're walking through the woods at night or um, maybe conjunctivitis whether it's whether it's um, uh, viral or bacterial or some sort of a pathogenic caused conjunctivitis you can also get conjunctivitis just inflammation of the conjunctiva if you have a certain types of allergies um, or just maybe just tired out herbs do really well that pharmaceutical medicines don't is they they work in in conjunction with tissue with different types of tissue so what you find is that instead of just you know taking something for a sore throat that to, you know uh, orally that's going to go through your bloodstream and, and work on on that that you can actually you want to affect the the actual tissue the mucosal layer of the throat so you can use what I call mucosal vulnerabilities for something like that, or if you want to affect the respiratory system, you can you can in, you could use steam inhalation to do that to actually coat and, and work with that, or you work with herbs that you actually exhale um, in order to excrete. You actually exhale like like juniper or garlic, where you actually get that that <coughs> um, route of administration comes out through your lungs in one way or another. Um, so we have a whole, I mean, dozens of different routes of administration, you know, everything from one side of the body to the other, where we're talking about douches and, and enemas and, and, uh, and uh, suppositories all the way up to, um, you know, um, neti pots and nasal type of administration and in ear oils. And, uh, and so one of those is an eye, is an eye wash. And so we, we take advantage of that. But in order to really take advantage of getting that herb directly onto the tissue, really touching that tissue and working with it, interacting with it, um, you have to you have to know what type of tissue that you're working with, and that that makes a big difference in terms of what herbs that you choose to work with. Okay, so not every herb works the same way on different types of tissue. This is really big, for instance, with poultices. But poultices the same way. You've got if you've got a cut or an abrasion or a burn and you're putting a poultice on it, there are different types of herbs that, that, that there are some herbs that, that you might think would work really well that just don't work really well with that type of tissue. And it's the same thing with the eye, in my opinion, to in giving an eye wash to cause more irritation really than you're helping. An eye wash should never hurt. It should always be rejuvenating and feel good. I mean, if, if it doesn't feel good, then it's probably, you're probably not using the right herbs. Eye washes are extremely effective. I use them a lot. I think they're very, very effective for many different things. And I think they're more effective than just washing the eye out. Now, if you have some sort of a, of a, of a caustic material, you know, an acid or an alkali or something that got into the eye, then of course you need to wash that, flush that out of the eye as quickly as you can. So your lesser irritation, of course, is washing, is the movement of fluid across the eye to wash it out. But if we're just talking about the things that, that, that I was I mentioned at the beginning of this video, which would be you know conjunctivitis or or an injury to the eye, uh, you know some sort of a, of a corneal uh, abrasion, or um, or tired eyes or an allergic type of you know uh, eye, then um, then washing it out is just going to cause more irritation. You know, so aside from washing out really you know very bothersome foreign matter, um, aside from that, I would say an eye wash is superior to most other forms of eye care, and an herbal eye wash sort of takes the best of both worlds and gives gives that sort of the nutrient uh, um, tissue uh, stimulation and, and tissue support and restoration that that tissue, that certain types of tissue needs. I just ran out in the backyard here and grabbed a few different types of herbs that I could certainly use. And one of them uh, that I really like a lot is not available right now just because it's February and that's mesquite. I love mesquite leaf uh, eye washes. Those are really, really powerful. Very, very good. But in uh, but without the mesquite leaf, still literally in my backyard within again within about three minutes, um, I've got a few things. I've got live oak so this is oak. I've got a yarrow leaf here, and I've got uh, agarita leaf. Any one of these three would be very good. So they kind of go uh, in terms of astringency. I guess I didn't mean to, but I kind of put them in, in astringency. This is probably the least astringent. This is probably more astringent. And this is probably the most astringent of these three. So any one of these are going to work. We definitely are, are usually are trying to go for astringency in an eye wash. No matter what we're doing it for, astringency is always good on that tissue. It works very well. Um, today, my favorite is actually yarrow. So we're going to go for the middle one. I dried. It could be fresh. It doesn't matter and I'm going to just put that into a mason jar and I'm going to pour some hot water on it and I'm going to let it sit in a cup of water just because remember we have to make a saline solution out of this now too so I got one cup and that means that I'm going to be able to add one quarter teaspoon of salt after I've got my tea and let that sit for a little while I'm going to grab a lid and put it on top of that and just let that sit and I'll come back and we'll finish up with, with showing you how we actually apply the eye wash and sit put a lid on it I shook it up a little bit I could have, you know, for those purists out there, saw I was doing this with fresh leaf, I could have macerated the leaf a little better, you know, chopped it up and then put it in there. And remember, we're, we're going for a weak, uh, a weak infusion here. It's not, it's not really necessary. I've only got three little leaves in there. Um, it's enough. Yarrow is pretty strong. Besides, remember that uh, too much maceration can make you go blind.
I wanted to do then was just put the leaves directly in there, let them sit, and let them infuse. And what I can do is I can then just check it by smell, and I could even pour some into a, you know, into my shot glass. Another reason to have a shot glass around and test it and just taste it. And this is another thing I'll get into this briefly when I talk about herbs you can use. But you can use, you can test herbs just by tasting them. You can give a good idea as to the astringency of them and whether or not they would work for your eye. And yarrow, um, certainly with the tea. Now that we've done with that, we're done with that. We could do it. We could taste the tea and just see how strong it is. And I already have. And it's 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 a weak tea, and that's what I want. I don't want a really strong tea for this. Um, so now let me just go ahead and filter it, and the easiest way to do that is just to, to go ahead and pour it in through a, through a uh, strainer. Okay, so now I've got my strained yarrow infusion, and all I need to do now is to, to get it to the right, um, the right uh, uh, saline, or the, the right amount of, of uh, saline in there, which is 0.9% again, to match as closely as I can my eye. Now remember, if we'd gone, if we already had saline solution, we wouldn't have to go through all of this. I'm out in the field now, and I may not know how much a quarter teaspoon is, so I'm going to just do that like that. That's about a quarter teaspoon there, close to it. Okay, drop that in there. We're close enough there to 0.9%, that's fine. So we can stir that up, or shake that up, or whatever we're going to do. And now we're ready. This is the right temperature, and it is the right uh, uh, percentage of saline in there. And we have, we are ready to go ahead and do an eye wash. So again, I could use any of these cups. Um, since I've already got an eye wash cup here, I'm going to go ahead and use that since that's the best thing I could use. Um, and what I do with this is I'm going to fill it up about halfway with my saline solution, with my, with my eye wash. About halfway. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that on my eye, put my head down and put it on my eye and then lift my head up. And then what I want to do is I want to leave my eye open and kind of move it around inside that solution and let that eye, that wash, wash it off. And it should feel good. It shouldn't hurt, okay? It should feel okay. And now open my eye and move it around inside. Blink it a little bit if I want. And unfortunately, if you blink, sometimes you'll pop the water out the way I just did there. And you get a good uh, saline um, drink there as well. So it's kind of a rehydration solution as well as an eye wash when you do that. Then when I'm ready, I put my eye back down. Ah. That feels really good. It really does. I mean, it's just refreshing. My eye feels good. I'm going to do that in the other eye. I'm it never hurts to get more beeswax on the string as you're doing this too. So feel free to rub that beeswax all along the fibers. Now that we have all our fibers twisted together as individual strands, we're going to want to uh, put a twist in it that will bring the whole thing together and make one uh, good size bowstring. And we're going to continue twisting uh, the length of the bowstring like this. And because these were only two to three feet in length, we're going to run out of fibers here at the end. And so before you get there, uh, well before you get there, you're going to want to start adding new fibers and laying those in here. Uh, start by adding new fibers and twisting them into small individual groups. I'm now at the length I need it to be for my bow. Just need to tie up these loose ends, twist them around, and weave them back into the bowstring. And the way I do that is I know that right here is approximately where I want my other end loop to be. So I'm going to lay some extra fibers here uh, just to add reinforcement here for the top loop, make it extra thick and durable. Now that I have those fibers twisted in nice and tight on the string, I'm going to make the loop and I'm going to go around and then go inside. Hold uh, the loop in place there. Now I have all these loose ends on one side and the actual bowstring on the other. What I'm actually going to do is untwist the bowstring here and start weaving these uh, loosened fibers back in on this um, bowstring. And then when we twist it tight, it will hold itself in place. I finished twisting in all those loose ends back in on itself and I'm just uh, twisting in the last few fibers. And then when we tighten this bowstring again, it will be forming a strong bond here that will uh, keep all those loose ends very tight. So now that's not going anywhere, that's going to hold itself. We got both loops in and got it at the correct length, so now we're ready to go try it out. 
We have our bowstring we just made here and we're ready to put it on our bow. This is my primitive bow. It's made out of vine maple. It has bare tooth knocks and backed with cherry bark. It was really fun making this bow and now I've made a bowstring to go with it. Uh, I made the upper loop on this bowstring larger than the bottom. The reason I did that is that upper loop slides over the bow and goes farther down and that allows me to uh, put this lower loop on the knock easily. And then to string this bow, I place the bottom of the bow on my foot and then I pull at the handle and push at the end and that will uh, knock the string just like that. Here's our linen bow string here on the knocks of the bow. There's that bare tooth knock and this is the arrow I'm going to be using so I'm just going to slide this right onto the string and then uh, be shooting it. And so I'm bare fingered shooting off my, uh, my hand here and it really lets me have a connection to the bow and get more of a feel for how it shoots. So I like the instinctive style shooting with bare fingers and shooting off my hand, not off a uh, rest on the bow. So we're now ready to shoot this bow. I have a uh, issue style primitive arrow here and I'm curious how this string performs. So I got a squash and we're gonna do some test uh, squash hunting with a primitive homemade arrow, homemade bow, homemade bow string. All out of all natural materials, so let's test this thing out. I'm really happy with how my linen fiber bowstring performs and I'm ready to go hunting with my homemade all natural primitive archery equipment. An animal. Yeah. A common artifact you'll find when you're doing the excavation is an awl made out of a bone. And they would use the awls for basket working. And so what they would do is they'd split one of these leg bones and they'd split it along here and they'd try to split it right down the middle. And they would leave this on. And so it would come up here, it'd be about this long or longer, and it'd come to a nice point. And then they would smooth that point so it's nice and smooth. And they smooth this right here a little bit so it doesn't dig into the hand as much. And so you would hold it, the piece, like that. And so we'll find a lot of them with this condyle still on there. Um, real common. So to a point, this, it would have been worn and smooth. Dearborn and an all. Yep. Right on. And you found that right here? Yeah, it's uncovered right here. So what do we do? I mean, all these things are getting washed away. Is it fair game for a camper to see it and then stick it back up in a cave or what? The best bet is just to put it right back where you found it. So when you move artifacts, you know, it's just, the rule of thumb is just leave it alone. I yeah. Mean, you can, now you can record it, you can get the location of it, you get photographs of it, record it right away to a ranger. So they can look into collecting it the property. Give me that back, you can place that's it back. That's an example of an all. Yeah, perfect. You know, and, and that's a be beauty. A museum piece. Yeah. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the reasoning with the archaeologists to let this stuff get washed away? The reasoning would be mm. is that if, if, if people get the okay to move artifacts, then they may not move them in the right circumstances. I see all these artifacts right here that have come down off of this, and the water washes over them and leaves them. So they're still here. Mm. I mean, they get covered up. Look at that, yeah. There's another back blade. Here's some bone, here's some burn bone. Um, what I wanted to show you was this. Yeah, that's a big, nice thing. So what this is, so <laughs> this is a classic example of a flake tool, probably a chopper, okay? Uh -huh. So, like if you're butchering, you want to chop through yeah, a Yeah, right. Or if you have a lot of meat that you're, you know, real aggressively, you know, scraping. Uh, or you <clears> could <throat> even use it for saplings. You can use it for anything. Yeah. Um, a braiding. But see how they very specifically... And they're not hard to make. I mean, it's a piece of cobblestone and you fracture it. And you pick right. up your fractured pieces I mean, and use them as knives. Somebody who's made 100 in their lifetime could make one in 30 seconds. Right, exactly. So you knock the flake off. Here's a platform. Uh huh. They knocked it off of a big cobble. There's your flake. And then you just take a hammer stone. Probably be a little smaller than this point here. Bang. Knock the flake, knock the flake, knock the flake, knock the flake, knock the flake. Right. And you're done. Yeah. You, you have a beautiful little, you know... Uh, chopping tool or chopping right tool. and these were super common 
Yeah. So, um, and this is really interesting. So this is a flake, and it came off of a, a, probably a round cobble. This is a cortex, so this would be the top of the cobble. If they found a cobble in the creek, this would be part of it. And then they probably use something similar like to bipolar reduction, where they hit it in the middle, and hold it with a leather thong or some grass or grapevine or whatever. Break it in the middle, that breaks it in half or more pieces. They take one of those halves and they start knocking flakes off it. And that's what this is. You can see a flake scar there. That could be big enough for an arrowhead. Uh, here, that's big enough for a knife. Um, sometimes what they'll do is they'll nap this down so it's a flat edge and that would have been a back blade, but they didn't do it in this case. They left it. Um, the reason they probably didn't knock more flakes off of this is because it's so small. You know, once they get to a certain size and you're trying to knock flakes off them, what's going to happen? You're going to hit your fingers. This is typical for a, a, what we call a spent core. And, and this, this was a material because it looks, at first glance, you look at the cortex surface, it looks like quartz. Like yeah, really. Quartz. Let me look at it again. But if you look at the interior, it's way too smooth for milk quartz. So that could be some kind of a white shirt. A shirt. I'll be done. And once again, it just shows the variety. And shirts are what? Mostly gray and white, huh? Uh, shirts come in a lot of colors. Oh, but, uh, that's a nice piece. This red. is more, this reminds me more of Oklahoma. Yeah. The flint. You know? Yeah. Everything seemed to be, we just call it flint, you yeah. know? And and, uh, and this was another uh, milling slab. Yep, yeah, this is another one. You can see. Amazing. You can see the depression right here? Yeah. And if you notice, I'm careful not to rub it with my fingers. Because you don't want oil you on ever, it? No, it's not because of oil. You don't ever want to do that. If you ever see an archaeologist clean one of these, if they do it the right way, they take water and they take a brush and they use the tip of the brush and they very carefully remove the soils off of it. They don't drag the brush across it. You don't you don't take a cloth and rub it because what that does is it Scratches grinds it. it. Yeah. It polishes yeah. it. Oh. And so you add a fake polish. Oh. And so if you cleaned it off with, you know, yeah. you know even grass or rubbed it on your pants and then you wash it you're going to see a polish that might not have been there and, that's, right. and then you're going to have, you're false going to have made an artifact. Yeah. And so the way we do it is very carefully use water and brush lift the dirt off. Right. You can see the indentation, the very slight indentation. So, Just like people have false beliefs about the Ishii saga today, so too Ishii may have had false beliefs and remained in hiding unnecessarily. Certainly when he came out of hiding in 1911 he was not harmed, but rather given a unique way to university professors to document his tribe. Ishii's napping of projectile points shows a Wintu style. Some researchers suggest that Ishii may have had Wintu relatives. Others debate that and offer that perhaps Ishii was napping points for the University Museum audience to show rather than from his traditional Yahi style. Ishii still had burnt singed off hair when discovered in Oroville in 1911 and so we know that he was still mourning from his mother's death in 1909 and so too he may have still been fasting as part of his mourning tradition. Ishii's demise was likely multifactorial to include fasting, reduced weight via cross-country journey, plus low thiamine, all leading to his poor nutritional state. Ishii's mother's legs were swollen and wrapped when surveyors discovered her, so one must consider heart failure in her differential diagnosis. It is important to think outside the box regarding the Ishii saga and Yahi demise. Heart failure was not common among traditional natives because they did not eat poor modern diets high in cholesterol and fats or smoke cigarettes which all lead to hardening and clogged arteries. So the possibility of low thiamine or beriberi remains a differential diagnosis in both Ishii and his mother.
So I just found some blackberries. Now, last time we were down here, it was early December. Now we're down here and it's mid-January. There's one big tree. So, oh, you know, that's huge. All the way out here. All the way out to here. That's a huge tree. All right, so as I said, plenty of acorn. Um, can go ahead and crack those open, mill them up, uh, well, leach them, of course. You can either throw them in a sock or, and leave them sit in the creek, or you can uh, boil them. Let's take a look at what else we have here. Vines, what do they do? Well, they give us material kind of like hemp to make rope or to use. All this, again, is poison oak. Now, this is what you cross, all these stems. And now the stems, um, here we are, there's no stem. You know, they do have resin, but it's lighter in an amount. But that's what we're looking at there. Let's move closer to the creek. Right here we see some fern. Now fern is, is certainly edible, but the gametophytes are on the back side here, reproductive. And you know, when they're mature, they're, they can be cancerous. You'd have to eat them in large quantities, but the little young sprouts are the best for taste and stuff. But certainly we would make do here. Leaf, let's get a good look so we can identify here. There's the berry, here's the leaf. If you look. That's all manzanita. This is a huge bush, well up over our head. Little new stuff growing. Here's the other manzanita. White, both sides, with berries. It's like wilderness. Find patches, you come here and harvest. It might take you to see if you can get here. If you really were interested in lots of berries, you can haul them back. Hopefully, nothing more than a day. Let's go on. Oh, bay. Of course, bay's all over. It smells wonderful. Um, most of this is bay forest, so this is nothing new. Here, is California Bay Tree. Everybody's familiar with this because it's got a marvelous aromatic scent, which is bay. It goes into stews with potatoes and carrots. Just love bay. Bay can be used for a lot of things. Now you can also break it and get the oils out or mash this up. Use it as a disinfectant. You can, some people use it as uh, insect repellent. I've used it a little bit. I'm not sure. I haven't done a controlled study, but it seems to work a little. Now what I like about bay is these new shoots. They're my favorite. There's enough here to put a huge salad together. Oh, it's, it's just wonderful. And the, and the little new shoots like this, they're not strong at all by no means. Yeah, also, at the right time of the year, you're going to find a green um, nut to it. And this nut can be ground up, made flour, make cakes out of it, things of this nature. So of course, we got your pine, ponderosa or Jeffrey pine here, always good for pine needle, but I also use fir and cedar. I've made teas out of it. Came through here yesterday and found this campsite, obviously an old yachting campsite. All right, we're just beneath the base of Grand Pinery. We have to start camping down. You can see the sun's already down on this side, it's going down on the other side. We are stranded. We went up some 75, 80 degree slope for the past several hours. In a little flat area, I'll have to clean out and make really flat. And we're gonna sleep here. We've only got one canteen of water, so we gotta make it last. We're all set up in this little cave. It's not much of a cave. It looks robust, but it's got a great overhang. But by the time you come to flat ground, you only got a small ledge. That's uh, Iron Mountain over there. That creek is way down in there, close to the water. I'm going to go on and see the trout. 
They're all throughout here. Look at that. Ishi was a master flint napper and often did demonstrations for visitors at the museum on how he made arrowheads. So here's an example of what Ishii's flint napping toolkit looked like. I basically used the same tools as he did. I used some traditional antler for pressure flaking as well as some wire or nail pressure flakers. You see a couple horseshoe nails there. And here we have a couple hammer stones over here. Okay, glass. Now, we know that Ishii used a lot of glass when he was on Deer Creek, but also when he was living at the Museum of San Francisco. Uh, we think his favorite glass was the blue Phillips Milk of Magnesia. He would ride the ferry by himself over to Berkeley and pull these bottles out of the dumps that were there on the shore. This is beer glass, probably wine. This is from cold cream. He's made points out of all of these. This is plate glass, possibly from a window. Here's another big piece of glass, and this is an example of how Ishii made his points. You go back and forth, like this, just as I've done on this part. You go all the way around it, and then you start pushing in um, longer flakes to thin it out. And then you make his beautiful redding side notch points with the narrow entry and the expanding notch. Saxton Pope records that he began this work by taking one chunk of obsidian and striking it against another, thus several small pieces were shattered off. One of these pieces, approximately three inches long, two inches wide, and half an inch thick, was selected as being suitable for making an arrowhead. Protecting the palm of his left hand by a piece of thick buckskin, Ishii placed a piece of obsidian flat upon it, holding it firmly with his fingers folded over. In his right hand, he held a sharp piece of deer horn. He pressed the point of the horn against the edge of the obsidian. Without jar or blow, a flake of glass flew off as large as a fish scale. Repeating this process at various spots on the intended head and turning it from side to side, first reducing one face and then another, he soon had a symmetrical point. and the point and foreshaft were reinforced with sinew. For this hunt, I found a tree located along a main trail and sat on one of the branches. It hit him right behind the shoulder and that obsidian head just buried deep. I saw it sticking out the far shoulder. That arrow killed him so fast, it was amazing.
I was surprised to find that my arrow was still completely intact and sticking out of both sides of the deer. It was also incredible to see that the arrowhead had not broken and was still as sharp as the day I made it. Tooley right out of the ground. Bottom tastes pretty good. Tooley's good. We'll make a shelter in my backyard out of all natural material that's going to be completely weatherproof, rainproof, snowproof, and insulated so that uh, you can spend the night in there and be comfortable. We're going to be making it out of willows and uh, cattails. I've harvested a bunch of cattails out of the wetland. You could also use bulrush for this, but we're going to thatch them together. And we're going to lash uh, these uh, willow posts in a circle and then bend them over and tie into a little dome and then uh, build a frame to that and then put on the cattails and just see how well it works. So I'm out here in a stand of cattails and what I'm doing is collecting the cattail leaves to make basketry, make a mat, and make shelter. I'm going to make a really cool uh, weatherproof shelter out of cattails and this is the perfect stage to be collecting them. The leaves are long. These are almost eight feet long and they don't have that center stem yet. Here's one that has that center stem and then the little cattail head and uh, these leaves will work too but what I like to do is I like to cut and gather this stage before it puts out that stem and that uh, flower head. And it cuts really easy with a sharp piece of obsidian or a knife and then I just uh, bundle them together and let them dry and store them in my shed and then I'm ready to uh, build my shelter or do a weaving projects in the winter. I like to get them when they're maximum length and just starting to turn color. So they're kind of green on the main stem and the tips are starting to turn. Perfect time to harvest these cattails. So I'm gonna get uh, couple hundred pounds of these leaves here, let them dry and use them for projects. The perfect size bundle to be hauling off and I need about 10 more of these, that'd be great. I am going to use this rock. This is a piece of obsidian and I'm going to make a hand axe or a chopping tool using this uh, hammer stone here, just a smooth river rock. And I'm going to hit uh, flakes off of this, which will make a good tool for chopping the willow stakes. Perfect. That's all I need. I have a sharp edge right here and that will be perfect for uh, cutting out our willow stakes. We're now ready to collect the willow stakes that will be the main support structure for our shelter. These are about an inch in diameter and it's a good size because they're strong enough to hold our structure up and they're still flexible enough to bend on top. And then you can kind of bend it right there. Perfect, right where we wanted. Very quick and simple and we need to collect a bunch of these so I'll just keep going at it with all of these uh, stakes here. For our cross braces we're going to use these thin willow shoots. These are very flexible and we can weave them in and out to make a side. It's going to start by uh, building the outline of the structure by shoving these willow posts into the ground. Putting in the last of my main support stakes, here's the circle that's going to be the walls. Now and with all our sticks in place, we're ready to start bending the tops over and lashing them at one center point. Then I'm just going to tie these off just to help and wrap these smaller tops of one around this side. For these willow main beams, I did about a foot spacing at the base, which gives me about 20 total. I did so. leave a little wider spacing here at the front because that's where I'm going to build my door. It's a strategy I like to use when securing these cross pieces is basically a weaving technique. It's where you start by going over, under, over, under, over, under with one, and then at the same level, you do the opposite, um, which is under, over, under, over, under, over, 
and you can see as you have a stick on each side they're working against each other and helping hold each other secure in place so that will make a great wall it's like a loosely woven basket or even like a fish trap in design and we're ready to add our cattail wall i take five or six cattails at a time in a clump and i'm going to do a double thatch where i'm going to have the large end of the cattails running all the way around at the base and once we're all the way around we're going to do a second thatch starting at the top and coming down with the large ends all meeting up there. We'll tie those together really good. All your cattail bundles together. You can do uh, another willow cross piece on the outside. You stick it behind one of the posts and you bend it over and that really holds everything together. And then you can weave this into your willow frame. Do a second batch where we're gonna have the thick end of the cattails at the peak. And we're gonna tie them really tightly together and the rain will hit this and flow down these leaves Hey, this cave is quite something. That's what I was looking up to. So I'm gonna call that lookout cave right now and get up there. Definitely have a camper in here. Not a lot of room. Someone's put a circle, no question about that. I'll have to look around here, but you can imagine this would be great as a lookout cave. But if a guy were to come over here and sleep, I think you'd get a little spot here where I'm sitting that totally gets you out of the wind. You're up high, you'd hear anything, nothing's coming up there. Just sitting here, you could see out there that she could have sat here and watched for a day, see for any movement. I've got to climb down all this. Well, right now it's looking best to sit right in there. There's some dirt inside there. I think that's what I'll do. As you can see, the weather is going to let me fully test the capabilities of the shelter. It will be great in the summer for providing shade and it's already proven to be waterproof in the rain. I was in here in a pretty heavy rain and it didn't leak at all. And now the snow is coming down and it's forming a nice insulated layer on there. And it's nice and dry inside. I uh, filled the whole base with cattail leaves so it's a nice insulated layer off the ground. I made a little door here to block out the weather from coming in. Uh, I'm going to show you inside here to show you just how comfortable it is. You enter the shelter through this little hole and as you can see some of the snow starting to come in when you don't have the door there. But this is just a simple door of woven cattails and it should keep all that snow out and uh, keep the heat in. So here's the view from the inside where the door is and uh, you can see the nice thick cattail leaf bed that we have here that will provide quite a bit of insulation from uh, the ground. Brush all over. A couple green leaves here and there you can eat. Those are great. It's just amazing in here. It's so thick. A lot more of this nice grandfather sage. Mmm. If you lived here, you would bend the bench with that and make a better path. That just gives you an idea the type of stuff that if she lived in here. While on Deer Creek, it's possible the Yahi decreased fishing frequency in fear of their being discovered, or that settlers were also taking fish and maybe even netting large quantities of fish via the creek-wide nets, as the area is remote and escaping authority policing, especially back then. So maybe their primary resource of trout for thiamine declined over time. It's also very likely that after leaving Deer Creek, Ishii didn't fish much while hiking across country, leading him to rely on foods that were very low in thiamine, 
Low thiamine, also known as beriberi, would help to explain both Ishii's mother's leg edema as well as her possible heart failure. In addition to other multifactorial origins, it's very possible that beriberi led to one of Ishii's nutritional deficiencies. Some Californian tribes had taboos against eating things like reptiles and amphibians, and so Ishii did not eat snake, while a modern survivalist today would fare pretty well living off snake. Also, in some ways, we have more knowledge of plants than Ishii was available to know in his time. For example, lupine pod is high in protein, but Ishii might not have known about the amino acids in that plant in place of meat, as lupine was not listed on the Yana plants list but it was known by other tribes. So in some ways, our trained survivalists today might actually fare better in some methods than Ishii did in his own country. Although Ishii may have grown up in the Stone Age, by the time of his discovery, he had considerable knowledge of European technology. This is proven via items collected from Bear's hiding place. Also, there are timbers at three known storage caves and the frames of storage and living houses at Bear's hiding place where they were cut with two known hand saws and there's anecdotal evidence from ranchers nearby. Drilled holes. Makes you wonder what it means. There's very young poison oak. This is some red bud up here in Ishii country coming out of the canyon. Wow, a lot of Indian paintbrush. And of course, Indian paintbrush is very edible. Where's that spice plant? See everything right here. Sure does look good. Spice push. Well, I picked a whole bunch of the spice plant. Pretty small or raw. It's all about getting it this stuff at the right time of the year. This here is a leopard lily. Okay, all these beautiful flowers. And what I've done is I've dug down and you get these little cloves to it. And then you eat this part. Now this is a new lupin coming up. <laughs> and lupin too. These are edible. Now this one here is lark spot, small lark spot. No shortage of lupin. Not bad. In here, fern. Hey again. Actually. We're getting pretty good, good close to throwing some seeds here. Seeds are always edible too. But that was mainly green. Perfect thing of gallium. Look at that. Very edible. Much better raw than cooked on galium kits. Too rough, tough. So all that's just popcorn. Beautiful, we're at the 100 foot ledge. The ledge cave, beautiful. And that water coming down. Okay, so I have an assortment of stuff right in here. And then over here, some of that stuff's underneath, and then uh, mostly soap plant. And over here, we've got some soap plant that we can do. This was popping right there. 
everything up here is yellow monkey flower. Monkey flower is definitely edible. Just take a bite from in here. The whole thing is edible. Not quite as good as Meyer's lettuce. A little bitter, but still very good lettuce. Below that, a lot of Miner's lettuce. Wow. Got some Miner's lettuce here. Mm -mm. Mighty fine, this is moisture. I have an assortment of wild edibles I have. I have some just uh, galium here, Monkey flower. Little Miner's lettuce is in there. And then some. And right here we have buckbrush flowers. Initially, they're okay, but then they get a little bitter. Hand of junk. Mm -hmm. Nice combination. Common fiddle neck. I don't think we've shown eating any of the common fiddle neck. This looks like the new flowers of deer bush candy bubblegum. Yeah. I ate it pretty sour. Just a little bit of this weed here. Uh, eat a little bit of that for dinner too. I uh, just saw wild vegetables. Now we got all the new soap plant coming up. Of course it's all edible. Could be cooked down like spinach though. There's the leaves and there's the flower. Right here we have a wild raspberry. Raspberry in there. Over there, just behind the raspberry, is a horse tail. So we've got a little bit of fern here and some older stuff here. Both completely edible. Okay, this is what we come at, but it's all edible to include the root. Yeah, let's see. Got a big one over there. Alright, once again we've got some balsam root. The flower of it. Mm -hmm. Mighty fine. And again, if you let the flower go to seeds, then you roast the seeds and make flour from the seeds. Mm -hmm. Mighty fine. The roots, also edible. Wow, here we have it proven as well pea. So, these are delicious. We got a poppy, we got a root in. California poppy is very edible. What we do here is we kick off a little bit of these and then we eat them. Mm. 
Very nice. And there are lots and lots of them. And these are called Sierra onions. Now the white stuff down here is popcorn. And this here is common fiddle. It's in the fern family. So we've had quite a few wild edibles ready. We leave clover with a little purple flower. Soap plant. Sear onion and a paintbrush. That's a nice combination. The Yahi were said to steal regularly from cabins and always leave the firearms, but sometimes they remove the sights, showing a rudimentary understanding of how they work. The Yahi made good use of settlers' trash, like glass for napping, nails to tip spears, and cans for storage. Having to rob garbage to survive was not romantic, but it was a reality. One rancher supposedly said that Ishii worked for him occasionally as a farmhand, and another man said that as a boy, Ishii would meet with him to feed wild horses grain. This paints a more domestic picture, which wouldn't be as exciting to many city folk as compared to Ishii being the last wild Stone Age Indian in America. Ethnography reliably records tensions between the Yahi Indians and other neighboring tribes, even the peaceful Maidu had tension with the Yahi during Bruff's time, as Mr. Bruff helped settlers on the Peter Lassen Trail when they went from Mountain Maidu territory and on through the heart of Yahi country. False beliefs that there were Yahi enemies to all people still persist today, despite Ishii's well-documented, gentle, peaceful character. I started hiking. I've probably been hiking four hours to get from here to there. So here Don's informant, Mountain Maidu Lily Baker, said that her mother, Daisy Baker, recalls when she was a child that there was a peaceful trade between some Yahi and the Mountain Maidu within Big Meadows, now Lake Almanor. Most Mountain Maidu today deny this, but Lily Baker was firm in making this and an important point to Don, saying that even her own people have false beliefs about their own history. Archaeology shows that the Yahi had resources to hunt, gather, build shelters, and to care for each other. Bear's hiding place, Ishii's shack location, the many caves, and the village sites are good examples. They're pretty flat up there. Oh, I'm really inside of Ishii's area. This is where he lived. So we got to, to know all these areas. See what I've targeted here is there's drainage on that side. It's a high ridge. 
and there's a drainage on this side, but the question is, is there any water in these drainages? This wonderful sink only has this. And I picked it. It's wonderful. There's the one way, easy way down. Bears Camp and this is a video of the main residence or house pit and there's a can right near the entrance to it now you can see this space right here between the rocks that's the opening or doorway to the house because it's Completely has rocks all around each side. And this is the depression itself. And I measured it, it's about 12 feet across. It's got quite a bit of buildup in the middle, but it's, it's very circular with rocks all the way around it. All the rocks from the middle have been cleared out. I timed to see how fast we could get up here. We took a leisurely walk, didn't really get tired, and it took us 25 minutes. I think, you know, Ishii could easily make it up here in a lot faster time than that, you know, when he had his uh, trail set and knew what he was doing. Um, yesterday, to get back down the trail to our camp, it took 20 minutes. So, um, not really that difficult, especially after being used to it. So, what I'm videoing now, this is what I think is the reservoir. It's about six to seven feet across, and in the middle, the leaf litter starts about two feet down, but it's really soft and spongy. So I imagine it goes, goes down a lot more than that. So we're back up here on day two. We're going to do some more stuff. We're going to look for the Matati we never found and see if there's anything else running around here that can be reported. he formally studied by anthropology, it's romantic to say that he was the last. And he wasn't the last, but he was the last one that was remembered and re recorded. Lots of miners, lettuce right here that we can eat. So that's how Ishii got the moisture at the base of the lava bluff. I'm gonna stop and eat breakfast here. All this miner's lettuce. Just, I mean, I've gotta keep hydrated, so this is the way to do it. Just using the Plants. Lots of moisture. This is what I need. I'm going to start grazing. Mm. Alright, that's the lava bluff we just came down. 
As far as dens in there. So we're on the lava chute here. Up creek side and we're looking for lava dens. Right in there, certainly you could hide in there. Climb on down. And here's another here. Maybe this a hiding way. spot, but not a sleeping spot. But this here. Uh, that looks pretty darn smooth. Yeah. Definitely looks like it could be a den in there. Uh, it's tight, but that's just what you're looking for. Nobody would see you. Okay, I'm now on the far end of the lava chute. So basically when the rain hits, this lava, what happens is that it finally gets down and all that moss, and you can just see it's kind of wet down in there. So you can get down there and this is just some of the runoff of water is you could find little nooks and crannies to drink from without going to the creek, especially when it was raining. Of course, when it was raining, he would just put a piece of hide out and collect the water. Plus, every now and then you find just a hole in a rock like that. It'd be just perfect to let the rainwater fill it up and drink right out. You can see all the lichen and moss through here. But that would be a nice bit of water right in there. So I just came over to one lava chute. I'm coming up to the other. Just looking at the steepness of the country here. Now yeah, it's almost maybe 50 degrees. Well, we're out of the lava chute, halfway up it or not even. And I gotta go straight up. The Ishi Cave is basically up there someplace. I'm looking for the Ishi Cave. So right at the base of the cliff bluff is a good resource for foodstuffs. We've got wood fern, miner's lettuce, galium. There are those bellflowers, popcorn. More edibles. Big old leaf here. So I've climbed up here and there's spice bush all over. This is up by a lot of outcropping. Spice bush right there. So this here, the reservoir, it goes down pretty deep. You can see it's kind of. We're at this is about ground level here, so it's a couple three foot down. Uh, uh, well, uh, here I am. I'm actually sitting in the hole used to hold snow because it's uh, about what, five foot diameter, four foot diameter, and a couple feet deep. Uh, uh, the camera's up on a level. Uh, there we are. That's an old bucket. It has a hook on each side. It would have been great for carrying water. Over 100 years old, think about it. bottom it all rusted out over here it's like a coffee can maybe something a little bigger that 
Oh, that could be a house pin. Hard to say. This hair's what I've been going through. It's just inch by inch. And I got a long ways to go still. So what we found here on the ground, right over here, is a saw blade. Broken half. So we know we're in the right area. Found another part of the saw. Let me put my gloves there so I get an idea. Now, even like in here, this she could start bending these <laughs> and just make the framework of a little hooch. They don't all have to be cut. Some can be left there to bend. Now, some of these aren't bad and they're straight enough, but you might be able to straighten them into an arrow. Some of that. Right there's a juniper tree, and it fell over, so it'd be perfect for harvesting some bow wood. This is quite the hole here, or by the crossing. Looks like a millstone. See ya. You're pretty good size. Picked up camp. We're all ready to go. Leaving this magnificent Yogi Cave. Back to the Mohawk Trail. Get down to the Graham. Eight o'clock in the morning. I've already taken 30 milligrams of prednisone with the side because it's getting more and more swollen shut. Worse than yesterday. Starting to tear, so wow. White ranchers, farms, mining, and general encroachment brought gross changes and stress, and the Yahi couldn't sustain their traditional family units of 20 to 40 living nearby each other. Limited space and resources led to tensions and killing, and many false beliefs about the Yahi being bad people. When the Yahi number finally got down to merely a handful, then the area could support them better. Early on, the local ranchers, hunters, and fishermen knew the Yahi were still there, but things became less tense with only a few remaining Yahi, and the balance returned. 
Finally, there was no evidence of the clandestine Yahi's existence, and so naturally, America was shocked when Ishii came out of hiding in 1911, which was 50 years past their thought extinction. Unfortunately, by sheer chance, the surveyors from the Oro Power and Light happened upon Bear's hiding place, and the Yahi may have realized their borrowed time had finally run out, and so it's not surprising that Ishii's sister did not return to remain with Ishii, but found safe haven with a nearby people. Mountain Maidu Lily Baker said she met Ishii's sister twice, and it's time for historians and movie makers to credit her and Ishii's sister both. No one may ever know the entire Ishii saga, but DNA may still someday shed more light. Ishii's DNA is likely on museum artifacts. We already know the Mountain Maidu genome has some Chinese within it, and so no telling about how the Yahi might have intermingled with other local tribes or people. Please help us protect the Ishii wilderness for future generations' research and enjoyment. Thank you.